I really wish I would have done my research on sex and math years ago. I think it would have changed my attitude and approach with it. Um, so maybe doing this video, it could help somebody else. But it is very interesting and there is a controversy um, behind it as to how these books got started and the story is very interesting and John Saxon was a pretty fascinating man. So we're going to do the history of Saxon math, the controversial history of Saxon math. Teachers are sharply divided between those who like the Saxon approach and those who don't like it at all. Let's not get into a dog fight. Ma'am, wait a minute. No. This, this is my session. Don't come in. For those of you that don't know, I might be wondering, you know, what's the deal with sex and math? Why the interest? Well, it is the math recommended by the Robinson curriculum. Kids normally start out their first book is uh, Saxon 5-4 after they've memorized all their math facts. And, you know, we're always on the hunt for the older editions, first, second, and third editions. And so we're kind of going to go into why of all of that. Um, it is popular still today, uh, mostly with homeschoolers, but some schools that have rejected all the math reform um, and Common Core and things like that. Some of them do uh, go back to the old past, as they say, classical math, and they use Saxon. I don't know how uh, rare that is, but I do know homeschoolers use it. They, they have a line out for homeschoolers with additional support, which is nice. Okay, so let's talk about the man behind the books, John Saxon, and what his story was. John Saxon was born in Georgia in December 10th, 1923, and he graduated from high school in Athens, Georgia. Then he went on and earned a bachelor's degree in engineering from West Point, the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1949. And then he got his master's degree in electrical engineering in 1961. He later went on to become an officer in the United States Army Air Forces, commanding a B-17 uh, Flying Fortress in World War II. Then he, looked, then he joined the United States Air Force and he flew 55 missions in a B-26 invader during the Korean War. He's known today uh, kind of as a Korean War hero. He even survived a plane crash in 1953 when a B-25 Mitchell engine failed upon takeoff. So he survived that. He also taught engineering at the United States Air Force Academy for five years. Then he retired in 1970 from the Air Force and he settled in Norman, Oklahoma, where he taught algebra part-time at the Rose State College in Midwest City, Oklahoma. This is where things really started happening as far as this math program. Um, he realized that students just had a really hard time with the, the way he was teaching it, with the concepts in algebra and so he wondered what if we had something he had his wife said he was just cursed with this clarity you know what if we just had this book this program where you know you're really doing a lot of repetition from previous learned concepts and building upon it incrementally and people thought that's too much that's just too much repetition you'd be doing hundreds of problems every single day he's like no not necessarily and and really how much worse can it be when they don't understand what they're doing now? So exactly what was it that was such a big deal? What was it that set him apart? Well, his basic philosophy or approach was incremental development and continuous review, okay? Incremental development meant larger concepts were broken down into smaller bite-sized chunks, more easily understood pieces that were introduced over time. There was also continuous review of previous concepts. So a student would complete a new concept, have a brief review of previous chapters, and the concepts were also tested. Educators uh, were very critical of his method and they felt that the lessons were too drill oriented and time consuming and they didn't allow students to use calculators and they differed from other methods by not encouraging teamwork or developing creative problem solving skills. This was a big thing for them. Dr. Elizabeth Stage is president of the California Math Council. John Saxon wants to do better at the things that we have been doing in the past getting kids to make computations quickly and accurately, getting kids to manipulate algebraic symbols quickly and accurately. What's wrong with that? That's not good enough. Why? We need kids to be able to make sense. And what does that mean? That means solving complex problems. Like? Like, what's a reasonable estimate of the amount of money that you should plan for to do 
there's something that you want to do, take a trip. And you have to go to math class to find that out? Where else are you going to know? For them now, I think a lot of the conflict was as well that he was an outsider and he was also, um, you know, he, he was a fighter, he was a warrior. There was some tension. There was a lot of tension there because he was an outsider and he wasn't playing by their rules. He was being very verbal, speaking out on how they were really damaging and hurting students and um, it was a battle. It really was. But Saxon says that part of the problem is he's an outsider, not a member of what he calls the math establishment. I'm not a member of the club. Really? Yes. And so they look down their nose at you. Well, and also I'm not very nice. <clears throat> These people are responsible for our children's education. They have been doing the job. And I'm very angry about it. And oftentimes I have difficulty containing my anger. And I say things, I lash around and throw my arms around, and I say things that, that, that people resent. What Saxon, what John Saxon did is he, you know, wrote the book himself. He mortgaged his house. He really believed in this. He mortgaged his house to get the funds. He made his own Algebra One book. He taught it. He rolled it out in Oklahoma. It was a pilot project. And then, you know, he was able to show results that this worked. He wasn't just bringing about a new book. He was actually producing results. Now, the first mention of this nationally was in a um, advertisement promoting the Algebra One textbook in Mathematics Teacher Magazine in December 1981. And it talked about his pilot project and the results. Well, this was like the shot heard around the world, okay, when it came to the math community. Without even seeing a copy of the book, a University of Chicago math educator professor wrote a scathing review and urged the readers not to buy the book. Okay. John Saxon responded with an equally scathing rebuttal uh, in a letter to the editor in the following issue. And so this really stunned the you know mathematics community. No one had ever talked to them this way. No one had ever returned the fire against the elite establishment so publicly. And and he was. He was a fighter. And now, you know, he told people that now he was in a good war. You know, instead of fighting the Korean War, now he was fighting the war for children, for their education. And that war lasted 15 years until he died in 1960, fought all the way. And one gleeful opponent suggested throwing a party to celebrate his death. He came into national prominence by a conservative thinker and publisher named William F. Buckley. Now, Buckley announced Saxon's success on the front page of the National Review magazine in 1981 with the headline Supply Side Algebra. So after his first book was published, which was Algebra, Saxon published more books. They had Algebra One and a Half, Algebra Half, and Geometry. Trigonometry and Algebra 3. Later, he co-authored his Calculus and Trigonometry and Analytic Geometry textbook with Frank Wang, uh, who was a graduate of mathematics at MIT. So as Saxon published books that he authored and co-authored, he found other authors to write all the way down to kindergarten level. Stephen Hank of El Monte, California, authored the books for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade titled Saxon Math 5-4, Math 6-5, and 7-6, and 8-7. Those are the ones that you see behind me. And Nancy Larson of West Haven, Connecticut, authored programs titled Math K, Math 1, Math 2, and Math 3. They even went on and made Saxon phonic and spelling books for kindergarten all the way through third grade, as well as a book on physics. So they got very busy and they made a lot of books. Now, upon graduation from MIT with a PhD in pure mathematics, Frank Wang was asked by Saxon to run the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And he, you know, started as 16 years old as a helper to him. Uh, so there's a picture of Saxon and Wang at John Saxon's dining room in the early years of the company and it appeared in the story uh, in the Washington Post on Tuesday, uh, June 19, 2001, and it was called Not on the Same Page. Some educators say Saxon math books are great teaching tools, but many systems, many systems refuse to use them. Wang became the company president in 1994. Now to imagine, he started as a 16 year old just helping him and became the company president in 1994. So John Saxon died 
on October 17, 1996, but the company that he founded was still owned by his four children. Frank Wang stepped down as CEO later in 2001, but retained title of chairman. He later left the company completely beginning in 2003, and then the children, his children sold Saxon to Reed L. Xavier in mid-1994, and it's currently owned by Hofflin Mifflin Harcourt. Now, I'm going to be linking in cards some videos. There's not many, there's just a few, and they're, the quality is really not that great. These were you know, on TV um, back, I believe, in the early 90s. But they really show you who the man John Saxon was. I can't do it justice. If you just see his attitude, his personality, his passion for it, I mean, it's, it's very endearing. We pull them up. The, the blacks and Hispanics have more pigment in their skin, but their gray matter is the same as the gray matter of a white person. And it's our job not to water down the testing, but to pull them up. And uh, we, we have been able to do this in schools all over the nation. I, I wouldn't think you would need a, a big mathematics background to be able to to teach that, I mean, am I missing something? Uh, yes, uh, you're missing quite a bit. I'll talk to you later. Uh, <laughs> they, they, no, 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 no. The teachers are trapped in the elementary school for six hours, and we cannot ask them to invent the math programs. Oh, then, then I have taken calculus for seven semesters. Uh, I took it at West Point, I made DD. That was all that was required. Then I was ashamed. I took it again my first duty station and made C. I took it when I went back to get my degree in Aero so I could go to test pilot school with Grissom and Cooper. I took it again when I got my two courses. I've taken it seven times. I have never made an A in calculus. Uh, but I have written a calculus book from my, from, from my vantage point of trauma and the horrible experience that I had with math when I went along. And we, we are writing, I'm writing books that will... I thought they were good because I could read them. I really thought I was dumb. These these people had convinced me that I was dumb. And I'm not dumb, and a lot of these kids out here are not dumb. Well, if you use the Robinson curriculum, you've probably noticed that parents are seeking first, second, no later than third editions. Most parents are not touching any of the new stuff. So why? I always thought it was because, you know, common core standards, you know. So I wanted to dig deep a little bit more into that and find out what exactly the truth was. You know, researching it on the website, I found that Saxon math is not aligned to Common Core. Now, for authentic Saxon materials, you know, what John Saxon wanted, buyers should purchase the books published no later than 2007, which includes the third edition of the textbooks. Now, the fourth editions of Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 were rewritten in 2008 by Hofflin, Mifflin, and Saxon's philosophy was not maintained by the writers. Obviously, there was a bit of a compromise when it got sold to Hofflin, Mifflin, and they did not retain John Saxon's vision. So the fourth editions of Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 were rewritten. So if you can, just stick with no later than the third edition on that. Also, Hofflin, Hofton Mifflin published a Saxon geometry textbook in 2009. John Saxon, however, had decided against a separate geometry textbook. And so he was very smart uh, about this because what would happen is inevitably they'd have algebra one, they'd have geometry, and then algebra two. By the time they got to algebra two, they couldn't remember what they had done in algebra one. And so the students started thinking, I'm not good at math. I can't even remember what I did in algebra one. So I'm not gonna take any further advanced math classes. And they didn't. And so so that's what he was trying to avoid and so he integrated geometry into the algebra one to an advanced mathematics books he felt this was the best way and it's it's sad that his strong belief on this was not honored when they went ahead and just published a geometry book anyway so the list of pure Saxon math still on the market also includes algebra half, pre-algebra, and advanced math and calculus. Since the Common Core standards were published in 2009, the content of the Saxon textbooks published prior to that year cannot possibly be Common Core, obviously. Now, for example, grades three to eight by Stephen Hawk, last published in 2007, are not aligned with Common Core, which were published in 2009. Now, supplemental materials 
that are aligned with Common Core are offered. Now what Hofton Mifflin did, the publisher did, is they created a supplement that was aligned with Common Core and they offered it to teachers if they chose to implement it. And so that's how they could get away with saying that they are Common Core aligned. But it's really a supplement that they offered the teachers if they wanted to use it. So if your student is doing uh, Saxon math in public school, you know, you should ask your teacher, are they using the Common Core supplements or are they not? Now, there were 7 million Saxon textbooks in circulation by 2004 when the company was sold. So many earlier editions are available from the internet vendors. Um, it is Saxon Today is used by half a million homeschooling students per year, according to Hofton Mifflin. Uh, so bookstores and websites that cater to homeschooling families are a good source of assessment for teaching materials now. And so like I said, many RC families like to stick to the first three editions. And you can still find many of these. I like to find them on eBay, but you can also find them in Facebook groups or um, you could try other websites as well, but they are out there. You can find them. You know, and these things happen inevitably when you're, you know, they're bought out by a different publisher, you know, changes are made. Um, so, how, however, it doesn't seem like any of the books are aligned with Common Core. It's just an um, supplement that they offer the teachers. But you know, it's up to you. Many parents just want to stick with the first three editions. I totally get that. I'm one of those parents. Um, so, yeah. It seems like the new books kind of spend more half time, new concept, half time, older concepts. Um, whereas with the older editions, it's it's more um, brief, the introduction to the new concept and a lot more review. Now, I want to talk about really quick um, my experience with Saxon Math because I have been vocal myself on my dislike for it. We've, you know, we've had a reboot and we decided to try it out again and see how it goes and it's a night and day difference and so i want to share what those little key things were in case you yourself are having a hard time with it like i was uh, what were those key differences that have made it just so much better this time around number one i believe when i first um, started sex and math in our home it was too early um, the first book that you're using is saxon 5-4 and I don't know if I just didn't really realize it or um, maybe I saw other kids starting it at a younger age, but you know, this is really like a fifth grade textbook, fourth grade, fifth grade textbook. Just because this is the first math book used in Saxon math, it doesn't mean that it needs to be the first math that the child is exposed to. This is why um, Robinson Curriculum recommends they be really solid on their math facts and you have your math flashcards, but they are solving for X already in the first couple of um, chapters of this, lesson in this. So they have to have a really strong foundation and I don't think I gave my kids a strong enough foundation before I put them into this and said, you're on your own and I'm not helping you, <laughs> you know? I believe that uh, Ray's Arithmetic is a really great foundation for the Saxon 5-4. Um, some people use Everyday Numbers, Everyday Number Stories, that's a free resource. I've, I've heard people saying that they went straight from that to Saxon 5-4, but you need, you need something there. Uh, for some kids, flashcards may be enough. Uh, for some, it's not. For mine, it isn't. Uh, so I use something else. I use Ray's Arithmetic right now and you can get that for free on the Robinson um, online bonuses if you do the online version. So that was one thing. And then number two, your children really need to be strong readers before you um, you know, have them doing this self-teaching. Math is supposed to be self-instructional and in order for that to really happen, one crucial element is they have to be strong readers. So previously, without having the strong foundation, without have, being a really strong reader, there were a lot of tears, there was a lot of frustration, there was a lot of doubt, and so I started doing other things. Um, now this reboot, uh, Izzy, who is 11, is doing 6-5, and Ellie, who is nine, is doing five four, and it has been just so smooth. Um, I, they're doing it on their own. If they get more than five problems wrong in one lesson, I just have them redo the lesson the next day, fix a couple that day, see what they did wrong, and then redo the lesson. Um, it's just so much different. It's just 
so different this time around and I think those two things were really key. Make sure they have a great foundation, make sure that they're really strong readers. Um, and also, I can't remember what additions I used the first time around. And also the third factor was just time. Um, I think they were just too young. Every child is different. Some kids might be ready for sex in 5-4 at like 7 or 8 or 6 or I don't know, you know, but some kids might need to be 9 years old, 10 years old. It just, it depends on the student on where they're at and so I think I was pushing it too early as well and so all of those things pushing it too early not a strong enough foundation in math not a strong enough reader those it's just the recipe for disaster which it was for me the first time and I disliked it so much but now that we've had some time to build and that their reading is really excellent and that they're a little bit older more mature and can sit there and have the discipline to do the work on their own and correct, be able to correct themselves and um, fix their mistakes. It's been a totally different experience. Okay, let's talk about the giveaway for this week. I thought about giving away like maybe an old Saxon math textbook, but I, I don't know how you guys would, I don't know how many of you guys would like that. So I'm gonna do a giveaway that I think anybody could enjoy and that is the quick flick bleh, a quick flip arithmetic which is a book that i've talked about in other videos like a fun way to do math um, this is for this is from classical conversation so if you do cc uh, and you don't have this book you might enjoy it but i think it's great for anybody so if you would like to be included in this giveaway just leave a comment below let me know that you'd like to be included that's it and so let's announce the winner for the painless set giveaway we have painless grammar painless spelling and painless writing and so i just did the general general i just did the random comment picker and the winner is antibars hopefully i'm saying your name right antibars you are the winner for the painless giveaway set. I will get with you in the comments and get your address so I can ship these out to you. And so yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying these giveaways. I'm enjoying doing them. Just leave a comment if you'd like to be included for the quick flip arithmetic. All right guys, that's all for me today. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the history of Saxon math and the man John Saxon. Make sure you subscribe before you leave, especially if you like these history type videos. I enjoy making them. I think many of you guys enjoy them. So um, we'll just keep doing them. Make sure you subscribe before you leave and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. So he says he will provide free textbooks to 500 major high schools across the country for a massive three-year test if his critics will do the same. It's a challenge. It, it is a challenging school system here yeah. on the country. And it is a challenge to the other major publishers of textbooks. If they have an answer, let's let them come up with it. And let's let them match my offer of $15 million worth of free books. And we'll go mano a mano, head to head, and we'll see who can turn around math education in America.